Yeah. Well, hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, hope you're having a good B side to Leeds 2019. And uh, you're all in the right place. Um, next slide. Okay. Steve. Hello. Uh, so, so who are we? Um, I'm Steve Davis. I'm an independent security consultant. Um, a bit obsessed with critical security controls, network security monitoring. I'm the co-founder of DC151. Uh, I'm Matt Hall. Um, and that's Matt on Twitter. Um, I'm a consultant at Clarinet. I have about 18 or so years experience in the cyber security, information security world um, professionally. Um, and due to that amount of time, I'm a bit of a cynic, but at the same time, a bit of an eternal optimist. Um, so I'm also co founder of DC 151. Uh, DC 151? Um, so it's Social Garden, it's Def Con Group, uh, it's LS1 and not the 113. 113. Yeah, we get stick for that. Um, but it's a regular meeting of hackers, makers, breakers, um, both from Blue Team, Red Team. Um, when we first spoke about doing it, um, I said, oh, it's a bit like cyber karaoke, isn't it? Like, people get up and have a chat if they want. Um, but everyone's welcome. It is every second Wednesday of the month. Currently at the Cross Keys pub, which is where the pre sites was last night. Um, format, anything goes. Mostly at the moment, it is sort of talks. Um, we'd like to get some more workshops in this year. Um, 30 to 45 minutes. <laughs> Or when it drags on to like two hours. Um, if you want to get in contact with us, follow us on Twitter, give us a message. If you want to give a talk or a workshop, we'd love to see you. Um, okay. So, um, <coughs> in this talk, um, we're going to introduce, I guess, the sort of concept and the idea of, of wargaming. And specifically, we're going to explore the use of wargaming as a means of like simulating incident response. Um, at a high level, um, we'll explain what it is, uh, why you should be doing it, how to plan it, and basically how to you know, deliver that as a thing. Um, the talk's structured, hopefully very logically now, um, some final edits in the pub a minute ago, um, and it, it, it should make for a relatively useful support aid. So we're going to make the slides available with all the notes, uh, the things being filmed as well, so um, I'm, we're reachable. So any questions, I want any help with anything, please get in touch. Um, so, core concept, what is a war game? Um, are you doing this? Book? Yeah, I'll, I'll, so, yeah, so what, what do we mean by war gaming? So, there's, there's the, you know, the uh, mandatory sort of wiki extraction there. Um, for the purposes of this talk, this introductory talk to the concept and the use of it around supporting IR, um, it's essentially a training exercise. That's our definition of it for, the, for, this, for this talk. Um, basically, lets you test stuff, people against you know, a realistic scenario and give you some idea of how well you'd fare or, or, or not. Um, now, the concept of wargaming isn't new. Uh, if you've ever worked in the military, um, they run live, you know, I say live, like rubber bullet simulated exercises, video table tops as well. Um, if you're old enough to remember war games, the film Matthew Broderick, the War Operations Planned Response Computer um, wasn't too far from the truth at its time. Um, various intelligence organizations as well uh, have been running sort of cyber war games uh, for quite some time. Um, well, this talk is really from both our experiences. Um, there seems to be relatively little or few private organizations who run a war game, let alone have a comprehensive incident response plan, if they have any at all. So today we're talking about these I suppose, immature organisations? Um, yeah, so I guess the reason why I really want to, th want to talk about it is, you know, it's an incredibly powerful tool uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. And I guess the thing we want to get across is one of those, one of the bigger reasons is, is the accessibility. Um, you know, you can basically, it's probably one of its greatest strengths. Um, you don't need a lot to do this. There's no, like, Super camp CISP for wargaming, like whatever, like you know, with a you know bit of bit of planning, the sort of um, the nod to do it, 
you, you can make this thing happen. Um, it's extremely useful like in the real world. Um, you know, I think we're all, hopefully all, I'm sure we all are, coming to terms with the fact that in, like, security-wise, um, we can't stop bad stuff happening. Um, can't build walls high enough or thick enough to stop stuff, the bad stuff from happening. Um, yeah, so quick show of hands. Um, who has done any sort of incident response scenario testing before? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and who's done it organizing one? Five, six. And as a participant, then that will be the other three. Um, just capturing that for stats later. Um, so I want to talk about why you should war game. Why should you care? Why are you here? Why should you care really? Um, I'm a pen tester at the moment. I have been for several years. Um, I've previously done, um, audit, QSA, ISO 27001. I built, um, defensive systems, IDS, IPS, firewalls. Um, so I've gone all the way from blue teaming and auditing to technically rocking up, breaking a network, writing a report, rinse, wash, rinse, repeat. Um, and you know, not all real world threats can be covered in a pen test. They're very useful. Um, so this is, um, about helping your, your company or your customer become more resilient against attack. Um, it applies to both red teamers and blue teamers and even students looking into getting a career in cybersecurity because your next job may depend on it. Um, I have a sort of an internal fight and battle if, um, if you have a CISO and you're choosing a new CISO, um, which type of CISO would you choose? Would you choose the person that had never experienced a cyber breach or one who had? And, you know, was in the seesaw role when it happened. Does so that experience gain you ability? We'll see you later. So, why should you care? Um, credits here to Sun Liu from his 2017 RSA conference talk for this slide. It's I completely it off him. Um, and what it is, is I've been around since the early 80s. I was born in 1980. So I got into computing in the early 90s. Um, I got into sort of hacking scene in the mid nineties. Um, so we've seen lots of you know, uprising computers um, and solutions regards to security that keep adding to each other from one year to the next. Um, the era at the top is actually um, that's joined to the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is a sort of an instant response. Standard, I suppose, um, originally created for SCADA networks in the US, and I think it was in 2017 it, it sort of became more open and was accessible to every organization, really. But yeah, in the 90s, there wasn't really a home PC market space that sort of grew. And at that time, most small businesses were still pen and paper. Um, a few started to digitize, and um, Internet connectivity was rare and slow. Um, if you sort of walked into a PC world in the 90s, I remember you, know, you had shelf upon shelf of Windows, well, either NT95 or 3.1 still. And right at the end, you'd have a couple of AV products, McAfee, something like that. I'm not, not plugging McAfee here, but so maybe some personal firewall and software. Um, that sort of taught people that security was a product they could buy, to we really agree with. Um, but as we go on through the years, um, the endpoint defense stuff with AV moved into more detective monitoring systems, IDS, um, security incident event monitoring. People start building socks. Um, where we are now, um, we are in an era of assumed breach. Um, in the security solution world, we're looking at endpoint protection, response, ID access management. Um, we've got de dedicated cyber business units within organizations now and CISOs and other C level roles. 
Um, and that's pretty much the advanced persistent threat guy. Um, and it's kind of scary, really. I mean, this is... I've been working in industry for a while, and just the amount of breaches now are telling us that all of our technological solutions aren't solving the problem, probably because the focus is wrong. So recently, DC one five one near you, uh, we hosted our friend Nick at the back, uh, son of Sun Tzu on Twitter, and his talk "Lessons from the Legion," in which Nick asked this question, which stuck with me: If we're all so smart, which we are, and we all work so hard, which we do, why is everything so awful and getting worse? So in the last few years, we've seen pandemic proportion attacks um, hit large firms around the world. Um, the four um, sort of sentences on the right-hand side, they're the four major cyber threats that the NCSE put together in their 2017-2018 the cyber report. Um, and we have, we've seen large breaches involving attackers who've persisted on you know, a target's network for years <coughs> Mario, <coughs> um, or several months, <coughs> Equifax. Um, yeah, quick. Uh, who can find Equifax quickly? <laughs> Where is it? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Now look, uh, last year that slide was so much different. Um, so it should be fairly obvious to people now uh, that we are in the age of assumed breach. So we're talking here about testing without pens and how to successfully war game an organisation to help prepare them for the coming age of resilience and recovery. Next slide. Come on, next slide. It's not going. Ah, there we go. Uh, this is the map of uh, the World Economic Forum's um, global risk landscape for 2018. Um, the risks we have seen uh, all those breaches show uh, what world we're living in right now. We've got cyber attacks up in the top right hand corner in the same region in terms of impact level and likelihood as natural disasters and climate change. Steve. Yeah, so we're all we're all sold, right? Like the tech's not working, we need to do something different. Um assumed breach, we're all good. No one's like shaking their head. Um, uh, kind of a bit prickly that though as a thing, isn't it? We need to sell um, the idea of wargaming because we can't rely on that assumed breach message to be um, bought. Yeah, <laughs> agreed with. Um, uh, yeah, um, you know, you, you work for any organization, they probably invested millions in like cyber stuff and telling them that it was all a waste of time probably is not, not going to go down too well. Um, cliche time. We need to take them, whoever they are, um, on, on the journey. Um, like the destination really is we want to get them thinking about breaches, like the act of the breach, the response of breach to breach. Um, start to break down the whole, like, I've got a perimeter, I'm okay mentality. Um, we need to get them to think about how they're going to respond and what they'll need to respond. Um, it's your uh, investment. Um, oops, jump back one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> wait, is it, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the journey thing. Um, it's one of the consequences of not doing testing, not doing incident readiness testing. That can help us sell it. Um, but, you know, life's a bit complicated. And as, you know, if any of you take this away, you try and do this at work with a client, whatever. There are consequences of actually doing this sort of testing and so, testing, and so we're going to call those out so you don't trip yourself up. Um, business keywords. Key right, so people, this is how you sell it. This is how you sell it, yeah. So people, process, technology, leadership of people too, first thing. Um, we need to, we want to really exercise leadership. We want to you know, get them doing the critical thinking, exercising decision-making in those less than optimal BAU conditions. You know, when things go sideways and you get a call at five o'clock in the morning, you want your leadership team to be able to make quick decisions, the right decisions, the best decisions with little, without perfect information um, as quickly as possible. Um, we want to get them working together. 
um, to make decisions uh, that are complicated. You know, your, your organization's probably not got one king or queen or emperor at the top. It's, you know, like the general, you know, telling everyone what to do. Um, there's internal power dynamics, all that kind of stuff, and might not have that authority. Um, the, I can't stress enough, like the whole, we need to exercise our leaders in being able to make decisions without perfect information. Because a lot of the cyber stuff relates in technology. Like I think there's this assumption that needs challenging that like you can send, you know, push back on the tech here, get them back in the server room and get them to come back with the perfect information so you can make the right call. It's bollocks. Like we don't know what's going on most of the time with the information we've got. There's no single source of information that you can pull on to get absolute clarity when everything goes sideways and everything hits the wall. Um, uh, like we do even know like leadership wise, if you, you know, who needs to be involved? Like, you know, it's not just. Your, your managers, you know, you, you have general counsel, data protection officers, you know, the leadership of your organization is probably bigger than a single layer of management. Um, you need to start asking um, all the time, have you got the right people in the room? Can you identify the right people? Can you identify, I guess, the wrong people? Um, can you uh, can you easily put together that short list of people that gives you the right representation uh, across the business, across technology, across product? However, your organization is structured, you need to break it down. Um, can you identify all the relevant skills and knowledge? Like, I mean, like, I'm currently working for a large international organization. Like, they have the challenge of can we identify if we've got the right people who can speak all the right languages in the room? Like, that's, that might apply to you. Um, and third parties. Yeah, third parties, suppliers, MSSP, SOC, uh, that software vendor that might be involved, reseller for cloud, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, process stuff, right? So, people leadership, like, um, have we got, uh, does, does everybody know what they should be doing? Like, you know, chances are your organization might have some dust state plan for incident response, you know, like on the shelf somewhere it's never been touched. Um, it's probably got some archaic comms plan in there, you know, like send facts to whoever, let them know stuff, you know, bad stuff happening. Um, does everybody know that like, simple and objective of testing might be? Do we know if we've got that stuff and where it is and how to get to it? Um, do we have the right? Do we know what the processes are to get the right people in the room? Like, can you speak with those critical suppliers and third parties directly, or do they have that secret list of people that they'll only speak to? Um, you got processes that you need to follow to keep people in the room. Bad stuff can happen at any time. Like, if you things go sideways on Christmas Eve, like, how how are you getting overtime sorted? Of, like, how do you get the authority to sort of I guess cajole, bend people's arms, get to keep them in that room. Um, do you have processes for capturing evidence and like documenting what you're doing? Like you know, some of this stuff you might rely on it immediately. It's all going to be useful in the long term, but um, yeah, is, is, are there rules you have to follow for chopping that up? Have you got regulators or anyone who external scrutiny might have a very strong opinion on how you should document stuff as you deal with a problem? Um, Technology wise, do you have the Basic, well, yeah. basic. basics are hard, but yeah, basics. basics. You know, firewalling logs, whatever. Are you logging everything? Have you got enough to work with? Can you answer the NCSE's incident questions? Do you know them off the top of your head? Uh, no, no, very much. I just show sure the NCSE. So, like, uh, who knows what NCSE are? Who they are? It's not too bad. Forty percent. Um, anyone come across their incident questions? One, two, three. Okay. So NCSE, Cyber Police for the UK, I'm sure they have a better way of being subscribed. Um, they put together a guide to logging and monitoring. Like basically, if you just like landed from another planet and you had to describe logging and monitoring to someone and why they should do it, they have a nice two-page article that details all that. And right at the bottom is a super useful table of these are the questions you need to be able to answer when things go sideways. We'll expect it if we get called in. And I think there's a fairly natural expectation that someone like the ICO would expect you to be able to answer those questions if they got involved. Like, can you, you know, the where, the when, the what. Um, seriously recommend checking it out. Um, yeah, give me all the bad news. <laughs> um, right, so, horrible fact of life. This talk's not all super positive. Um, Sorry. But, um, for some people, everything boils down to money. Um, all security stuff, whatever your sort of view of the industry is, probably for the organization you work for unless you're a vendor, they see all security stuff as an overhead, like we're a cost. We add complexity to the business and we're probably a pain in the ass. Um, if you've ever worked, like Blue Team, if you ever worked like Core InfoSec, 
you've probably had to play the justification game. You know, like I need five analysts because I've got a shift to run. You can have three. So what does that mean? Like we'll not do Wednesdays and Sundays and put that on Twitter and the bad guys won't, won't hit us those days. Um, it's a horrible truth, that same sort of logic around um, like money. tech, money. Yeah, it gets applied to people and roles. Um, they always need justifying. Justification typically needs reinforcement. Um, one of the extra value adds of wargaming is is generating, you know, in the context of a very real world problem, the value of those people and those roles, and sometimes versus the technology and stuff that you already have in place. Um, this one. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. Um, so demonstrating alignment internally uh, we've got uh, seesaws now that's a thing um, and some of them some not all have a seat at the big table where the rest of the sea levels exist um, so wargaming can arm those seesaws with quite a tangible example of what state the business is in and how it can respond to an incident uh, they can use the results uh, from an exercise to support their case for investment in technology or people, or both. Um, that later. Um, it can demonstrate the maturity of the organisations to external um, parties, insurers, regulators, um, positively affect your brand internally if you can somehow demonstrate that online um, and draws attention to the competence of the leadership team, positively or negatively. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the flip side, there are some potential negatives. Um, it's not pleasant when an incident happens. Um, heads do start to roll. Um, usually the CISO is first to go. Hence the question about would you want a CISO who has experienced speech or not. Um, Quick show of hands, isn't that? Like, yeah, actually, quick show of hands. Um, Who's worked a breach, like first breach? Right. Who would hire a CISO who was in a role of CISO in a major breach? Right, and everyone else just no, we're not hiring that person who oversaw a breach. <laughs> okay, um, well, yeah. So the CSOS goes, he gets shifted in with someone else who's green. Um, staff start to worry. You know, they lose respect for the business, they lose respect for management, and they walk out too. Um, and on the public internet. Um, history does tell us that if you have a breach and it gets out into the news, um, people will talk more about how you responded to that breach rather than the size of it or what data was involved. If obviously that chat about whether or not it's PII or credit card data, etc. Um, and thanks to Infosec Twitter, um, you will likely get a free pen test all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and yeah, another one. If you do start to war game and discover that really no one's got fucking clue what's going on, uh, you basically got two options. Get out of Dodge or buckle up. <laughs> With the space balls reference. Yeah, you can either like run away or just like fix everything. So Steve, on to planning. Right, so I've given him all the really bad yeah, slides. He's given me all the admin sections of the top, the really dry kind of uh, death by PowerPoint bits. Um, so yeah, so planning like design. So we're broken the planning down essentially into two bits: got the design in the war game, and then, and then basically getting the right people in together, selecting the how and the when, and then finally we'll, we'll talk about execution. Um, so planning, I uh, guess, four major building blocks. Appreciate there's a gap on there because it's a thing. But, um, you know, we need some objectives of the test we want to do uh, or the testing we want to try and put together. Um, we're going to need to select a realistic scenario to sort of try and draw those out uh, or put focus on those objectives. We need to break that scenario down into chunks or what tends to get bounded around in IR testing land as injects. Um, we want to put together some guidance, optional guidance around the injects to sort of, <clears throat> I guess, oil the wheels and keep it running smoothly. Um, planning, like, it's a very high level question, but you know, what do you want to know? Like, what is it that you're actually testing? What do you want to verify? What, do you have enough information to ask a question? Like, you can use testing to sort of pull that out. Um, 
you can focus on themes. Like, can we just... Do we know what we're doing? Like, might be one of those themes. Um, or can we test a specific... Yeah, thing? like, do we have firewall logs for that that's strange satellite office in the Middle East? Um, if that data comes up in AWS, can we work out which one of our, I guess, internal customers that data probably belongs to? Um, you know, whatever it is, it's quite generic, so everyone can get used to this, but you need to work out what it is you want to test before you start. Um you're going to get the opportunity to sort of, you know, make this perfect narrative to focus on these things and, like, um, I guess make the testing happen the way you want. Um, hopefully the um, the questions you have aren't impossible to answer. Otherwise, I guess you're just going to make people frustrated. Um, you don't normally share the objectives with the testing participants. Like, you might not even share the, the details that you're going to do testing with them until the very last minute and we'll come on to that. Um, Selecting a scenario? Yeah, picking a scenario. Um, you need to have your organisation but you shouldn't have to go really far for, it, for inspiration. Um, ask people what's keeping them at work at, work at night. At night. Um, if you focus in on some concern your sponsors actually have, you're not only probably going to get um, their, guarantee their buy-in, probably going to fight for it more, I guess, passionately. Um, it's probably going to do the business or your organisation good in the greater, you know, the greater scheme of things. Uh, news and further than that, news and media, like wait 10 minutes, check Twitter, someone's probably had a breach, right? Um, you might have customers, clients, or regulators that have very specific concerns. Like they might ask a pointy question because someone in your industry has had a, some kind of incident and it's not public knowledge. You know, maybe think about how you can sort of hoover up those inputs. Um, Filling all out these bad things daily on Twitter, which is basically this feed of um, oh crap scenario ideas, like normally taken from the real from real life. Um, super useful. Um, start small, especially if you've not you know first. I imagine this is this new to, is new to most of you. Like start simple. Like don't go like full bandersnatch for the first one with like the multiple. You know you are Netflix. Or you don't want them to be Netflix. Kind of which way around it is now. Uh, but yeah, you know just. Start something small, ask a very specific question if you can. Um, do non-disruptive to start with, like getting people around a room in your organization and not doing a day job might be a big ask anyway. Keeping them in the room is probably not too much of an extension of that. When you, If you have a scenario where you're posting people off to foreign lands or the data center, it's probably going to get a bit more complicated. Um, the objective of starting testing should be keeping testing. You're looking for hopefully iterative improvement over time. The more complicated these things get, hopefully the better your response or ability to respond will become. Um, it's a journey. Pretty sure. um, some example scenarios like bumper pack, uh, Tesco's value incident scenarios, whatever you want to call them. Um, very cyber orientated, appreciate. I figured that'd be right for the audience. Like if, if your principal concern is like physical, like that's totally great as well. Like, you know, if someone finds a Raspberry Pi in a comms cabinet, um, what else we think? Yeah, yeah. Someone finds one of those bad USB cables, and it turns out to be a phone bug. Like that's, yeah, that's a good one as well. Um, breaking it into injects. Um, yeah, they need to be like the major plot points and twists in the in the this narrative you have in mind. Um, try not to give away anything if you can. Um, you know, just provide enough information to move the story along. Maybe promote some of those kind of next step questions that you can cover off in your guidance but um, keep, keep them to about five yeah yeah. in a one day maybe. <laughs> I quite like the idea of the one tweet inject like haha I got your data no extra information like what well, well, we'll use that maybe something like that as a guiding principle um, rule of thumb in a full one day scenario I'll usually look to burn through about five injects with people going off and doing stuff um, that's your narrative, you need to be able to tell your story in five chunks then. Um, if you somehow get signed off for like a month long thing, like write to me, let me know how that worked, how that played out. Um, guidance, yeah, so. Um, Each inject will have some like natural questions which will arise. Yeah. Um, so you should really be prepared for them, um, but it shouldn't affect the. Should it detract? Inject. Yeah, should it detract? Yeah, should it detract from the testing? You, you know. They sort of, I don't know, um, do they tell us anything? You know, if, if the inject isn't specific enough, um, 
I don't know, it's the unit to your organisation, but um, you can confirm the whole, like, no, there's no extra information. That can be as simple as your guidance can be. Or if you have any, I guess, natural follow-on questions that you'd want to provide the answer to, like, um, you know, think of those. Like, if you are, it all depends on your organisation and how like, your internal, like, touch points work. If you always get certain information when someone reports a thing a certain way, like, have that drafted. Like, I've had draft service desk tickets to support things, like, printed out and it looks legit. Um, it adds reality to the scenario as well. Um, again, it, it, whatever your scenario is, however your, your organisation works, um, yeah, the guidance is quite specific to you. Um, ultimately, though, get your testees to do all the work. Um, that's what, yeah, don't let the guidance be their easy way out. So sort of low level then when you've got this thing written up, you should end up with something like this. Obviously not in these weird, super bright colours. Um, but the index of the things you share, the guidance, you probably keep that in your back pocket and provide it specifically to each question that's asked. Your objectives, you probably don't share them with anyone other than the sponsor if they're not involved and in whatever report you write at the end. Um if you're struggling sort of conceptually, it's kind of probably how it will work. You have the story. <coughs> the injects kind of relate to that. There's guidance to support them. But the thing you're really wanting to pull out is the response, like the what people do and the decisions around what they should be doing or decide to do. And you want to tie that up to your objectives. And the timing of your injects uh, can be important as well. If you've got a narrative running, people are halfway through their thought process, boom, get an inject in there and just screw everything up. Basically, you're just an arsehole for a day. <laughs> um, so, so on to actual planning part. Um, Sponsorship's key. Sponsorship is key. Find someone within the organisation who is going to be your key player. Um, identify the participants and you looking to find really everyone um, in the business. You want IT ops, Devs, um, HR, PR, legal, senior management team. Um, you got overseers and check the schedule for major conflicts. Yeah. Is it the sponsorship thing, like, you need license to operate. Like, at the end of the day, this thing's disruptive. Like, like anything, when you take people away from their day job, there's like the business, the organization's incurring additional costs there. Um, you need to get this thing signed off, I guess, with enough authority to to not only get the okay to make to let it happen, but also then the support to make it happen. Um, without it, like the thing's not happening. Like you, you know, I guess there's the opportunity for the non-committed sponsor to get you to go away and do all the planning. But if they don't, let you know, basically back you up on the day where you go to ask for people's time, like. It's going to be you in the room in the room on your own with some pizza. That's probably not a bad thing, but, but yeah, um, yeah. The sponsor, you, they might be pushing you for this sort of thing. If not, you're gonna to have to explain it to them. Like, sell it on benefits, break it down into these kind of like building block components. Walk and walk it through with them two or three times. Uh, but yeah, you, you really need them to back it. Um, and it will be, you know, it's a low risk. Yeah, there's no if it's tabletop. You know, it's literally... What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, what's the worst that can happen? Pizza. For that pizza. For that pizza, yeah. Um, and high reward. Um, yeah, I've seen from the couple I've run just a lot of information sharing just within room, you know, colleagues who all of a sudden like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, oh, right, well, we do have a plan for that. Or, we have an office in that country. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the kind of good stuff, yeah. Um, your participants then, like, um, you need to identify you know, who you want in the room, I guess, at least to start with. Um, the sponsor, like, whoever's kind of backing you on this thing will probably have some opinions on that. They might want to, I guess, depending on your scenario, they might want to test a business function capability in a certain area with a certain remit, maybe. Um, if you don't know who needs to be in the room and the sponsor can't give you the clear steer, like, boom, that's objective one. Like, inject, bad thing happened. Task one, like, right, who find out who we get in the room. Like, do we know who we get in the room? Um, are they still with us? Um, o- overseers, adjudicators, referees, whatever you want to call them. Um, it's probably you. Like, this whole thing needs, like, support and someone to run it. I think I heard it, I think Nick referred to it last night as the white team. Is that right? Yeah, it's like larger, larger, hundreds of people involved type testing. There's a dedicated team at uh, the middle one for these kind of 
feedback loops, um, in the middle team. Um, conflicts and distractions, like, don't plan these things when there's an office move on or the World Cup or, like, something really sensitive, like, you're closing a branch, like, get a mask up because it's going to just tie and feather the whole thing. Um, logistics. You, you know, this is all grown up stuff. I feel like I'm preaching, like, yeah, shouldn't it? Yeah, you all got, you all got this. Book a room. Yeah, get a room. Get an AV and, like, not a TV, you know, get a, get a presentation screen at least. Yeah, print stuff out in advance if you need it and be conscious about how you do printing. Like, don't, don't, if you have a Reaper graphics department or something, don't send all this kind of stuff to them in advance because, like, no one's going to turn up surprised on the day. It's going to have got out. Um, yeah, pizza, snacks. Um, the last thing then on the planning stuff is, is, is basically sending out the invitations. Um, Obviously, based on the support of the sponsor and the type of organisation you're in, you're probably going to be candid and tell people what this is, like IR test, whatever, blah, 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 this room on this day. The sponsor might not want you to do that. I've had a bit of that on an engagement where you basically say, I don't know, free cake, and you invite a lot of people, and it's like, boom, the door's locked. It's Cut your pie. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. I'm still doing the push and pie. Cake's, cake's a lie. Uh, push and pie. Um, when you do send those invitations, um, People are going to complain. Like, not everyone's going to be on board with this. Um, expect it. Um, you probably already know. Ooh, those people. Yeah, you probably got a good <laughs> feeling. Um, the sponsor might even have specific concerns and want to validate that as part of what they get out of this. Uh, you know, we've got a whatever team, responses in their remit. We've got a test and response. They're not happy they kick off they don't think it's the best use of their time you know expect it um, start to think if you can in advance of how you handle those people team might not be your problem might not be your fight like find out who it is and, and make it theirs um, try and be sympathetic I, I have to remind myself not to be a jerk you're all probably all okay like um, like influence over instruction can't remember where I picked that up from but yeah basically try and get people on board um, if you can um, offer them the reality check like this is the kind of mantra I go through when I'm speaking to people and then happy about this sort of thing like, you know a bit of reality it's never, it's never been a good time for this thing now should be no different um, I know you're busy you're super important you're, without your thing this company would just fall over um, but we need you like the boss says you've got to be in the board are expecting you um, like seriously Branson asks for you directly like you've just got to be you this thing can't happen without you it's all about you, baby. Um, whatever. Um, when it <laughs> again, I have to tell. Like, try not to be like dick. Yeah, w- one ambulance. Uh, yeah, one ambulance is my new like yeah default response to people that complain so much. The big thing to take away from this though is like, if you do end up with anyone in the room that's just there because of some JFDI order that's come down from on high, like they're not really in the room. Like they're not there. I've had someone fall asleep on the game. Yeah. <laughs> Like, they'll probably be disruptive, they'll probably be a jerk, they'll probably mess it up for everyone else, they'll detract from the whole thing, they'll get in people's way, um, they might try and derail the whole thing, like, um, get them out, find someone else if you can. They'll do it on Friday at, like, 4 p.m. Yeah, it's good. definitely not pub hours. Um, <coughs> then. So, um, roll call. Um, take everyone's names. You need to know who's there, who didn't come. Um, explain what is going on. So remind them why they're there. Try to get them into the spirit of things. It, they can be fun. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom, despite my previous slide. This. Um, but do set some ground rules. Um, you know, not arguing in between each other and remind them that the sponsor will have some expectations of, um, of their input. Um, some ground rules can help people get into it. So it's about setting the scenario um, and keeping them within, keeping them within the game. Um, Not fighting the scenario. If you have one ground rule, it's that is like you can't write the perfect test. Maybe you can. If you can, again, message me. Well, I'd love to know how, but however you cut it, however much research you put into this thing, like even if you base it on previous incidents, I guarantee on the day, someone's going to find an exception with the details. Mm. Oh, that guy didn't work on Wednesdays, and we've had that thing logging forever. Like, you know, just those things detract. This doesn't apply to our environment. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, doesn't matter if your email's on or in, uh, on site, on prem, in the cloud. You know, like email goes down, deal with it. Yeah. If if you can get people not fighting the scenario, you've pretty much cracked it. Even if they know that the thing that you're up against will probably never happen, you're you're getting all the benefit. You're testing that thinking. You're testing that decision making. You know, it's uh, you still get the value, even if they can't immediately go away. Write it up and know if that thing ever happens, they can sort of use on it. So game over. Um, you got to formally conclude it. Stand, stand down. You're taking notes. Send out thank you cards, no flowers, whatever. Um, get any feedback if you run any polls. Um, note down your highs and your lows and things like that. You, yes, will probably have to write up a report. Um, best in conjunction with your sponsor. Um, observations, recommendations, like review the incident response plan for what's one. Um, and Gaps. Improvements. Yeah, yeah. Gaps are a big takeaway. Um, share those with the sponsors. Yeah, d- d- don't do this thing and then like get around to finishing the report six weeks later and then tell people that you, you uncovered some horror show. Like, you didn't have coverage here. You identified some horrible risk. You found some office that you didn't know you actually had. Like, you know, if you, if you spot those big things, like straight up, P1, sponsor, I need five minutes of your time, boss, here's what I found. <laughs> Um, get it into their mindset and let them work out what to do with the big and findings. If, and if you can do sort of high level presentations and sea mm. levels about what happened, then that's very useful as well. I run a lot of polls in mine. Um, so at the start, there's like a poll about how do you understand your current instant response plan for X scenario, and then just look at the changes and um, run start run at the end, see how people change, and just do it again. Just keep doing it. Um, Assuming it wasn't a complete toilet fire and like. You know, you've not burnt every bridge that you can say. Like that initial wash up is the best time to sort of get sponsorship for keeping doing this as a thing. Um, if the first one sucks and you burn all your, you know, political collateral, probably don't ask to do another one. So, coming to the end, some conclusions with about fifteen minutes left. I think um, nothing brings people together like a shared experience, um, either real world incident or um, a simulated one. Um, the analogy I make for the benefits of doing the uh, wargaming is uh, sort of be fire alarm drills, or Nick gave me a great one, uh, sparring with your partner. It's about muscle memory. And if you were downstairs and saw Zoe stop this morning at the keynote, um, the concept of wargaming does apply there. So getting that training mind and the active thinking when you're in your beta wave mind um, to it's just intrinsic, and, you know, you're just responding in alpha ways. Um, because, as well, in a live incident, it goes back to Zoe's talk, you can have people, you know, suffering post traumatic stress for things like this. So, your wall game wants to identify the people that can handle that and, you know, understand that some people can't deal with all the uh, uh, issues that might arise. Um, so, Technology does provide a bit of an illusion of readiness or capabilities. Um, we have, you know, looking at the breaches, four or five decades worth of buying another product, buying another product, sitting on the network, another black box, doing pretty much nothing because no one's looking at it. Um, that's gone on far too long. <laughs> and we're going into the age of recovery and resilience. Uh, we've got immutable, infra- immutable infrastructure, containerization, things like that, where you're reducing the attacker's persistence on your network, hopefully. Um, but if your data gets out, you're going to have a breach, and just breaches will continue to happen. There will only ever be more breaches, but I don't think we're going to solve that problem in my lifetime. That's quite pessimistic. Man. Keep it light, <laughs> keep it light. Um, it's challenging that primitive mindset. No matter how many files put in place, segmented, segmented networks, someone's going to punch a hole in that firewall. Some three letter agency is going to put a hardware implant to get past your air gap network. Um, so we're about preaching resilience and promoting that readiness and recovery. It is a balance of technology and people. I think we focus too much on technology recently. It's coming to the end. Um, 
we, the ones we've run so far have been quite simple for organizations just entering into the idea of wargaming. There are, you know, it's quite mature in some organizations. Um, our approach has been very linear, very train tracks. Here's the next step. Um, then go on the train and there's the next step. So the future sort of direction that we want to go in is the choose your own adventure band stash style. Um, I was speaking with Nick last night, we had a good chat. Um, in one, one method of doing it might be having like a red team in one room and a blue team in another room. And red team might like, make up an inject on the spot and that's then fed through to the blue team in the other room. And we'll just go back and forth. Like no active testing, just all on the tabletop. Um, I think that choose your own adventure style, um, s- scenario might also work well with C level execs. If you basically give C-level execs a financial decision to make, do you put more capex in technology? Do you put more apex in um, in people and process? And then sort of, oh look, no, you're the next Equifax. <laughs> we might write a book about that. I'm not committed to it. Thank you for listening to us. Um, we will take any questions on any heckling right now. Yeah, that's it. Targeted abuse. Let's go. <laughs> Um. Thank you for your time. Yeah, I appreciate some of you were, were here half an hour early, but mm-hmm. anyone got any questions? We've got about 10 minutes left, I think. No. I'll go to pub, right? I'll go to pub. Cheers, sorry, David. Oh, oh go on. Yeah. on. Um, what sort of size company would you think this starts to become useful for? Um, I've worked with local and regional councils, and um, the smallest organisation I will be doing it for is a debt management agency with approximately um, 100 staff, half of which are going to be call centre agents, and I am on an infosec team of about one person. It's, it's about testing the whole, like, how you respond. So, I mean, there's no rules on whether you're a five-man company or a 50,000 head kind of, like, you're probably going to get the call at some point. And the response can either be structured and really involved or it can be as much as, I guess, the realisation that you put the phone to the CSE or the Ghostbusters or whoever and ask for help. Um, yes. Yes. Have you seen uh, increasingly over regulatory perspective do you foresee um, IR uh, getting sort of the same focus in the future? GDPR. Yeah, it's a, I think the current state of IR it like it is, I guess, partly to it's, it's to blame or it's related to the current state of DR and BCP. Like DR and BCP at the moment, for a lot of organisations, are that ring binder on a folder that's you know hasn't been updated in many years, and you blow the dust off, pull it out, and go right. What do we do? Like, um, I think IR's in a similar state. I think it's IR's being kind of prepared for in the same way. Like, we'll have a very rigid plan. We'll have a master incident process, like some really sexy rhetoric around it. But underneath the hood, it's just step one, two, three, hit the call plan, send the text messages, close the office, update CV. Like, it, it's, it's immature. Uh, I think it's immature. It's directly related to that around BCP. Like, you know, some organizations, you know, I've been places where, they showed me their business continuity planning, and it's because I mean, they've had been able to show that they've got an office in um, Christchurch, and they, you know, there'd been an earthquake in recent history, and they'd lost people and facility, and been able to recover. And the story they could tell was amazing. Um, the one organisation that I can amount, that I can recall who BCP did not suck. Like I think IR is IR is just a branch of business continuity. I think. Do you agree with that? Or it's a, it's a really ugly sibling. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It depends how much traction this talk gets on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's your question. Yes. Um, can I ask what industry you work in? Mm-hmm. Can I ask what industry you work in? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think the tangible things are 
one of its biggest benefits because you, you end up with these conclusions and observations that you don't. There's no other lens that renders them visible. Um, you know, like the whole have an office in that country, like that's there's some truth to that. Like it's all padded it out a little bit, but um, you don't stress in something, you get a very different result than just sort of relying on what you've been told. And uh, you know, it's the trust but verify thing, isn't it? I think um, it's good to hear that. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is like definitely first steps because uh, we only got interested in it. I mean, uh, this talk actually originated, it was Steve's first talk at DC when we started in October 2017. So, um, and yeah, so I'm getting into it from my level of pen testing because I've been doing red teaming and I'm like seeing all these breaches thinking, like, pen testing is not solving the problem. I'm just going and wrecking the network. Um, so. <laughs> you, yeah, I think you, you can make it as like the scenario. You yeah. can make it as complicated and as bespoke for your organisation as you want. Like if you want to, you know, you want to drop a rogue instance EC two box in yeah, you know that department's VPC in AWS, and like see if they spot it when it starts interacting with stuff. See if they know what to do about it. Yeah, that if that works for you, like there's no rules. But, but that's uh, <laughs> the point you're making was like uh, awesome. the purple team style exercises yeah. that we'll do. Um, where it's not full on, like no one knows there's something going on. We'll pop someone on site and drop an access point in the network, see if the wireless IDS picks it up, and then start watching people what they do, how they respond to that. Um, so it sort of does sort of blur the line into a real test. This is testing without any pens, but yeah, I think it, it does work. Yeah, this is very much a sort of introduction to the concept. Like I think I probably end up doing some sort of mock, uh, some coverage in some form of more advanced testing with yeah technical specifics. Um, the injects don't have to be narrative based. They could be events you generate on the wire, um, offices you close, people you dismiss and send home, and account for as casualties or disposed of or whatever. Like it's whatever works for you. It's going to take you. take a lot more planning though. It's just, that can be very disruptive. Yeah, so good. Cool. Good. Good. Thanks very much. Thanks for all coming.